Good morning. Good morning. Did you follow along in your bulletin on the call to worship? It says it's on page 771, but it's printed right here. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. O Lord, humans and animals, you save. O God, how precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I would like to, uh, before we have our prayer for peace, I'd like to acknowledge the acolytes, and especially Pam, who does so much to, uh, with her committee. She doesn't do it alone, but uh, it means a lot to have our kids come up and light the candles and extinguish them at the end of the service. So thank you, Pam. Thank you to the acolytes for doing this important job for us. I've already... Uh, Put light to our candle for our lamp. Let us pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, as we remember those who are in harm's way this morning, we give you thanks, Lord, for those who keep the peace, who are our peacekeepers and our peacemakers throughout the world, especially in the trouble spots that we are so well aware of. Be with them this morning, protect them, and bring them back to us safely. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us welcome one another in the name of Christ. Hey, Helen. Hey, peace of Christ to you. How are you? One seventy two, one seven two.
Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, we pray, Lord, your presence with us. We pray your blessing upon the message that you have given to me. And we especially ask, Lord, that you reveal your love, that we may reflect that love as we come in contact with other people. As we look at all of our hymns this morning on the theme of love, we ask, Lord, you help us to be more loving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would invite our young people to come forward this morning for our children's time. first thing you're going to notice is that Mr. Booby is not going to sit on the floor <laughs> because if I did I'd have to get Dave Studley to help me get up and he's about as old as I am so uh, but at any rate one of the things that I want to share with you and talk with you a little bit about is love and I heard the announcement a few minutes ago as probably you did that in a couple of weeks you're going to be singing, Jesus Loves Me. So let us practice the first verse, okay? Can you, some of you, how many of you already know Jesus Loves Me? This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, for those of you that do, sing along. For those of you that don't, you're going to learn it soon. And we've got some assistance here to help. So let's, uh, if we can get some music, we'll sing it through. Jesus loves And thank you, Michelle, for helping us. I didn't know that they were going to sing this in two weeks, or I might have not done it. But anyway, it was good practice. And it went along with the theme that I want to talk to you briefly about, which is love. What do you think, what does love mean? What do you think? Anybody got any ideas? What's love? Okay, you take love God and taking care of people, right? Right, love Jesus and worship God. So love means that we show to other people that we're around that we do nice things, we say nice things, and we're kind to them. Okay, and that's really what love is all about. And Jesus love should shine through us when we meet other people. Come in contact with them. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we think about love this morning, we just reflect on the importance of showing love to those around us so that the world can be a better place because of what we do, what we say, and how we act. We give you praise and we love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Good morning. I'm here to give you an update on our community garden. For, for those of you that weren't or aren't aware, the community garden is a joint effort between uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension and Chapin Living Waters. It's a garden in the back of the Chapin Living Waters facility, um, and it was started last year. The beneficiary of the community garden is the Watertown Urban Mission. Last year we had a little bit of a shorter growing season. If you remember all the floods that we had at the, uh, the beginning of the growing season, we got a late start, but ended up providing the Watertown Urban Mission with over a thousand pounds of vegetables. This year, it has grown. The, the garden itself is, a, is the same size, but you wouldn't know it. It's a beautiful, beautiful garden. If you ever get a chance, it's on North Colorado. Um, it's in back of the Chapin Living Waters facility, and it's, it's, it's just gorgeous. We have already harvested about 1,300 pounds of vegetables, and they're, it will probably top 1,600 pounds because there's still a lot of tomatoes, a lot of squash, a lot of celery, eggplant. There's, the garden is, is just gorgeous. So thank you for anybody that helped, and the congregation at Asbury deserves a thank you also because we donated $500 to Chapin Living Waters to make a cistern. And they have done that, so um, we have contributed in many ways with work hours and with um, monetary donations. So thank you. And if you get a chance, you really should go over and check it out. Thanks. Thank you, Deb. The uh, God sightings, joys, concerns are due next, and the ushers do have microphones as usual. So if you have joys or concerns, things you'd like to be shared before we have our morning prayer, this is the time to do it. If you'll hold your hand up, one of the ushers will bring a mic to you. Are there joys or concerns? Max? Yes, um, Paul. My wife and I have a small joy. We did travel last weekend in North Carolina to spend uh, a birthday with my daughter for the first time in 15 years, but her stepson, who is uh, dealing with cystic fibrosis, uh, just got a report back the other day that his lung function is now down to 65%, and it's dropping rapidly. So uh, over the next six months, things may change, but it doesn't look that well. So prayers for our grandson, Will. It's really nice to see John Ciro in church today, and Ellie. Welcome, John. As you know, John has had shoulder surgery, and uh, he's got a period of time yet before he's back 100%. So he is, um, don't ask him to write too much with his right hand yet. So. Anyway, others, other concerns? <laughs> I just want to say, praise God, that Tom has finally started to heal. He had a tiny surgery on the 18th that turned into a small nightmare, but all much better right now. Thank you. Yes, I well, wish to have the congregation continue their prayers for our daughter, Michelle, who is in California for a continued treatment for breast cancer. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Yeah, I have a small joy this morning. My son Matt has joined us today, so it's just good to see him back in church. Yes, <laughs> Sarah, Sarah is what? Sarah Payton came home. Okay, I'm told that Sarah Payton did come home. That's great news. So. I know that the family much appreciates everyone's support for the fundraiser. Okay, if that's it, let us spend a couple of minutes in prayer. Join with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we are grateful for your encouragement to bring our concerns to you. 
You've heard the concerns expressed this morning from a situation with cystic fibrosis to breast cancer, to shoulder surgery, and good news that Sarah Payton is home. We do ask, Lord, your continued presence with us, and especially we ask you to remind us to bring our praises to you. So many good things happen in our lives that don't just happen, and we should not just take for granted. But because you care for us and you are there, preventing us so often from getting into difficult situations. Lord, we are grateful that your disciples ask you to teach them how to pray. And we pray, Lord, your presence as we continue to worship with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first lesson this morning is taken, oh, I'm so sorry.
I'm back. <laughs> the first lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Hebrew, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The second lesson is taken from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. And as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. The third lesson is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33. <clears throat> Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is 170, again on the theme of love. Oh, how I love Jesus. Please remain seated.
The message this morning, as you can see from your bulletin, is entitled, The Church Faithfully Serving Until Jesus Comes Back. This message centers on the church, what it is and what it can be. In Hebrews, we read how Jesus became the sacrifice and the high priest in and for the church. No longer were animals required for sacrifices as they were in the Old Testament. Before I begin the message this morning, I'd like to reflect on the churches that have helped mold my life. And if you keep track of this, you'll figure out exactly how old I am. <clears throat> From 1940 until 1965, I was, for 25 years, I was active at the Belleville United Methodist Church. I was lay leader, I was Sunday school superintendent, and a few other things. Whenever the church doors were open, I was there. In 1965, when I became an administrator for the first time at South Jeff, we moved to Adams, bought the farm that we recently sold to our son. For 1965 until 83, I was active in the Adams United Methodist Church sang in the choir and did many other things. And at, in 1982, my first marriage came apart. And when Greta and I were dating, we both had teenagers at home and we decided that instead of expecting her to fit in and come to my church, which was again, Adams United Methodist, she, at the time, was going to the Free Methodist Church, which was on Outer Arsenal Street, out by Bosey's. We decided that we would start fresh, and we wanted a church that had an active youth group for our teenagers. We wound up at the Watertown Church of the Nazarene. For 19 years, from 1983 until 2002, we were involved and active in that church, and that brings us up to 2002 when I came to work here. So 2002 to the present, the past 16 years I've been here. And of course, for, the past, for 20 years, we were active in the Fort Myers Nazarene Church in the wintertime while we were in Florida. Now, as you know, Jerry and Joyce have graciously given up their home and we have to find a new church when we get back to Florida this year. So I'll tell you next year what it is. I'm not sure. They went to the Methodist Church. We also have friends involved in the Nazarene Church in, in uh, Lakeland. So we are plowing new ground when we get there. I have learned so much about what a church is, what it can be, and what it should be. We need a church family to help us grow in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Yes, we can be a Lone Ranger Christian, but not nearly so effectively as through the support of other Christians. The church is a gift to us. We need a place where we can experience God. We are not saved to sit, we are saved to serve. The church is four things. According to the Bible, number one is the bride of Christ, second, the family of God, third, the army of Christians engaged in battle for him, and finally, the priesthood of all believers. We are called by the promptings of God's Holy Spirit, confirmed through Scripture that communicates and emphasizes, this is my plan for you, this is your mission. There are several myths about the call of God in our lives that I would like to share with you. First of all, that God only calls people who are young and those with unblemished pasts and those with impressive resumes. Not true. God calls us all. Second, in each situation, there's only one decision that I can make and still be in God's will. Also, not true. We may have several opportunities, all of which would serve God and be in his will. And third, if I blow it once, I've blown it forever. 
God can never use me now. This is also a lie. The God who calls us is filled with grace. Think of Paul. If this were true, Paul would never have become the great teacher, missionary, planter of churches, and author of much of the New Testament. Jesus made it very clear that he intends to accomplish his primary purpose for coming to earth as a human and for his three brief years of ministry through the church. He gave the church the Great Commission to take the gospel to all the world. He also gave them the Great Commandment, both vertical and horizontal, to love God above all else and with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. The early Christians knew this. They knew that when they decided to follow Jesus, it would change the hub and focus of their world. Their life would no longer focus on self. It would no longer be about me and what I want. Paul said, the life I live is surrendered to Jesus Christ. We must understand today that serving the Lord is not one spoke among many on the wheel of our lives, but rather the very hub of our life. If we are Christians, and Jesus, then Jesus must be the focus and the main hub of everything we think and do. When Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 33, the very last verse of the scripture that Jim read this morning, he said the number one priority of your life should be seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. If we do this faithfully, everything else will follow and fall into place, like the formation of marching soldiers. Have you ever wondered why people come to church? Some may actually come to hear the message, to hear the good news of the gospel. Some come to participate in or hear the music and be inspired. And we, how much we appreciate Kathy and the music program of this church. Some come for the study of the word, what the Bible says to us. Some come to be involved in prayer, both for ourselves and for others. All of these are very true, but one of the greatest reasons people come to church is the sense of community, the sense of belonging. We are on this journey together that one day will lead to eternity in heaven. We need each other. When we are born again, we are born into the family of God, and that's what the church is or ought to be. We have the privilege of having fellowship with flesh and blood Christians. Like our lungs need air, our souls need fellowship. That is my primary purpose for which I was hired over 16 years ago at Asbury, so we can grow together in both knowledge through our small group studies and fellowship through our activities. The truth is, my friends, those of you who never participate in small group opportunities are cheating yourselves and only taking advantage of a small portion of what the church has to offer. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but if you, if you ask Lindsay and Dan, Pat and Darlene, Herb and Deb, Barb Sargent, Shirley Berry, Kay Phillips, and I could go on and name many others, you would find that there is a benefit from being involved in our small groups. If I were to stop breathing right now, I would be gone in a very short time. The lungs need air. So it is as Christians, we need the fellowship, the support, and the interaction of other Christians. There are many opportunities that Asbury has and offers to get involved in activities. Please don't be labeled as a Sunday morning Christian. Choose what interests you and become part of something bigger than yourself. Statistics tell us that only 40% of adults who come to church are involved in any kind of small group from Bible studies to quilting, prayer groups, book club, the many other multitude of things 
that this church has to offer. The danger there is that we miss out on one of God's choicest blessings for us. The church should become our surrogate extended family. Let us think about our relationship with our neighbors for a moment. I read a story recently from the Boston Globe that a lady in Boston had neighbors who were less than responsive. A neighbor boy did more lawn when it became an eyesore to those living nearby. When her pipes froze and burst, they called the city and had her water shut off. With the mail piled up on her front porch, they called the post office, but no one bothered to check and see how she was. The police finally found a 73-year-old woman, five years younger than I am, dead. The paper reported that she was likely dead for up to three years. One neighbor who lived 20 feet away said this, we're not a very friendly neighborhood. She said her neighbor used to come over for company and to talk, but she said, I had two jobs and I just quit answering the door. Wow. That's not the way as Christians we should be. We should become the salt and light to others in the world around us. No wonder the writer of Hebrews from our scripture today says this, let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds and how we can encourage and support one another. And it ends with, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In the scripture, the word day is capitalized and it refers to the end times, the day of judgment when Jesus returns to the earth in person. The facts the writer of Hebrews was saying to encourage one another, every one of us has times in our lives when we need encouragement. Amen to that. Sometimes stress at work, difficult family circumstances, health issues, financial concerns, sickness or death cause us to need support and encouragement. This is when we need to come alongside each other. You can impress people from a distance, but you can only impact them up close. The general principle is this. The closer the personal relationship, the greater the potential for impact when needed. There are times when we can spur and encourage each other, such as lobby time at church, or in our case, after the service as we fellowship around the table of refreshments. Pick up the telephone. Your voice is important. Talk, don't text. That tells my age, doesn't it? <laughs> Use the mailbox. Write a note of encouragement. This is becoming a lost art. This can become a source of blessing as people read over again and again what you've written. Also, the ministry of presence. During a crisis time, illness or death, just be there. Your presence is much more critical than your words. I believe this with all my heart, that Asbury can be an amazing place of love, fellowship, and caring if we were all to get behind such an attitude and commitment. The stipulation is that we must be committed to this purpose as a body of Christians and that we become a one another church. There are some 40 verses of scripture about one another in the New Testament. I'd like to share a few of those with you. John 13, 14 said, says, Jesus said, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should do it for one another. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another. John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Romans 14, 13, do not pass judgment on one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another. Galatians 5, 3, serve one another. 
Ephesians 4, 2, be patient with one another. And finally, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another. I trust you're getting the picture. Encourage each other. Pray for each other. Make time for each other. Consider each other. On and on. Hebrews 10, 25 from today's scripture says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but rather let us encourage one another. When this scripture was written, there were likely no church buildings, but rather they met in homes. The fellowship, not the building, is what was important. We have this responsibility to each other. Let us not abandon it. There's a danger today with so many demands on our time for sporadic church attendance. Other attractions come in, we tend to fall out of the habit of regular church attendance. When you drove to church today, two out of every three, or 66% of your neighbors that you pass, chose not to go, and this percentage seems to increase every year. In the 16 short years that I have been here, our average attendance at our 1015 service has dropped from more than 160 to less than 120, which is a 25% decrease. And some of you have memories when it was much greater than 160, maybe even when we occasionally had to use our balconies. On an average Sunday, two-thirds of Americans will find something else to do. As you likely know, Bethany United Methodist Church is closing a month from now. Their last service is October 28th. We need to reach out and welcome people from that church. Many may choose First United Methodist due to the fact that the same pastor, Jeff, has been serving those two churches. But let's not lose our opportunity to make them feel welcome to our church family. Among young adults, only 26% attend church. I couldn't believe this statistic, but it's stated that in England, only 6%, I repeat, 6% attend church. Here is what Paul says. Jesus Christ has replaced the old sacrificial system, and we are to be involved in the church of Jesus Christ. When a person neglects the church, here is what happens. Number one, you're saying you don't need the fellowship of other Christians. Second, you're saying you don't need to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Third, you're saying you're not very concerned about the spiritual condition of your family. Four, we welcome to, when, when we come to church, we express our love for God. We read in Psalms, in the midst of your assembly, I will praise you. Fifth, it builds our spiritual strength. Faith comes by hearing. Six, coming to church brings us into the Lord's presence. Remember the familiar scripture in Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name. You can finish that. I will be in their midst and bless them. Number seven, when we attend church, we honor the Lord's day. Six days we work, and on the seventh rest. And I add that I am a hypocrite to express this when I occasionally think I must mow my lawn or accomplish other tasks on Sunday afternoon. When we come to church, we believe in its ministry and its mission. Luke 4.16 says, Jesus went into the synagogue, which was the church, as his habit was. So we are following Christ's example. And number 10, we need the encouragement of God's people. A pastor had been preaching and stressing church attendance for a couple of weeks, and he received a letter in the mail that went something like this. Dear Pastor, you often stress church attendance as being important for a Christian. I think a person has the right to miss now and then. Shirley, that includes you. <laughs> I had conversation with Shirley this morning about a temptation to do something else other than come to church this morning, but here she is. <clears throat> Every person ought to be excused for the following reasons. 
and the number of times is indicated. The Christmas holidays, two times, the Sunday before and the Sunday after. New Year's, party lasted too long, one time. Easter, need to get away, it's spring, two times. July 4th, a national holiday, one time. Labor Day, the end of summer, start of school, two times. Memorial Day, need to visit the cemetery, one time. School closing at the end of June, one time. School reopening in September, one time. Family reunions, three times. Stayed up too late on Saturday night, nine times. <laughs> Death in the family, two times. Anniversary, once. Sickness, five times. Business trip, once. Vacation, six times. Bad weather, twice. Ball games, two times. Or, and races, Gerald, two times. <laughs> For some of you, you can substitute hunting and fishing for the, for the races and the ball games, but uh, Herb, that's for you and I and maybe a couple of others. Unexpected company, two times. Time change, spring and fall, two times. Specials on TV, two times. If you add this up, it adds up to 50. Pastor, you can count on me twice, the fourth Sunday in February and the fourth Sunday in August, unless providentially hindered. Sincerely, a faithful member. <laughs> there was another elderly lady who also had a neighbor boy who mowed her lawn, who shoveled her walks, who helped her with groceries, etc. One day she asked him how he turned out to be such a fine young lad, whereupon he answered that when he was younger he had a drug problem. His parents drug him to church and Sunday school each Sunday, <laughs> to prayer meeting, to revivals, to church camp, to youth groups, etc. We need more of these kinds of drug problems in our church today. We hear a lot about young people leaving the church. Here are statistics that express the opposite, why they stayed. 60% of young people say church was a vital part of their growing up, and I can vouch for that. 57% say they believed the church would help guide them. 50% of young people say they believed the church helped them become a better person. And 42% were committed to the purpose and work of the church. When we miss church, we begin to drift and our faith becomes lukewarm. Do you realize that the privilege of attending church today in many parts of the world is denied or they are persecuted if they're caught. Pakistan, Somalia, Libya, North Korea, and so forth immediately come to mind. We should be so thankful to be able to worship as we desire and be a part of the church. I close with these thoughts on serving faithfully till Jesus comes. Hebrews 10:25 says, the day is coming when Jesus returns. Jesus is coming back. We must be faithful to ourselves and others. The return of Jesus is an anchor in the faith of our church. If Christ is not coming back as he said he would, we might as well lock our Asbury Church doors. In Acts 1, 10 and 11 we read, while they watched, Jesus was taken up to heaven. They were told that this same Jesus would come back again in the very same way he was taken. The same Jesus is coming back. Satan would love for us to become detached believers. We need to remain faithfully doing his work until he returns. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Only God knows the date and time. But Jesus will return. We can take it to the bank. Let us sing the following in closing. I love you, Lord, which is 2068, 2068 in the Faith We Sing book. <clears throat>
believe that our ushers are ready to wait upon us for our morning offering. Let us continue our worship as we give back to the Lord from our many blessings. Father, we thank you for being generous to us. Help us to ever be generous as we give back to you. You were careful and very explicit in teaching your disciples that it is important when we give that we tithe, which is simply 10% of what God has given to us. Help us to ever be mindful of that and do our very best to be obedient. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn is the right hymn, but the wrong number in your bulletin. It is 453. More love to thee, O Christ. 453.
seated for the pulse loop. Thank you for the extra blessing from your whistling. We are indebted. We appreciate it. I know that people ask her, now don't play this Sunday without whistling. So uh, you got your wish. God has brought us here. God now sends us forth. Thanks be to God. You're dismissed. This has been a broadcast of the 1015 service, Sunday morning, from Asbury United Methodist Church, located on Franklin Street in Watertown, Asbury United Methodist Church.